Thank you very much. As you will see, my presentation links up, I think, quite well with that of um, Ronald's um, in, in many respects. But of course, I was asked, well, I was asked here to come and talk as a historian, which I will do. And I, my special thanks goes to Hein, who upgraded my humble presentation into a real keynote. Um, so I'm very pleased to have at least double time to explain what I mean. Um, I always tell my students that I consider history um, as a social science, and many of them are shocked when I say so. I say it's a social science specialized in time, or better, specialized in long-term developments. Um, and why I think uh, this is important also to the social sciences as a whole, because long-term um, uh, developments and comparing between now and then, but also here and there, is crucial to a certain um, to what extent current trends are really so new, but also to crucial to identify um, uh, all kind of path dependencies and entanglements between uh, in, in developments between different parts of the world. So to me, comparing is key. Um, comparing both in time and in space, and I will give you an example of how, why I think um, this also um, pertains to migration. Um, so when, as a historian, I look at the field of migration studies and uh, with the aim to compare, there is immediately, there are huge barriers. Barriers especially because there is no unifying definition of what constitutes a migration step. I mean, there are many, many uh, definitions, and Ronald already touched upon that um, in his presentation. Um, so, uh, what we, if we really want to compare between, let's say, the 16th century and the 20th century, or the 21st century, or between China and Europe, we really need a model that allows us to make um, uh, these comparisons and to, to be sure that we are measuring the same phenomenon. Um, and in that sense, let's say I'm very, also very glad what the DEMIC team did, uh, especially for the post-war period, and well, I'm also glad that you already started some of your data in the early 19th century. Only um, for long-term comparisons, I think that the definition of the DEMIC team is not ideal. And I'll, what I want to do is to present an alternative. Um, again, this, it's not that one is better than the other, but in the things that I'm interested in, and that is especially the relation between cross-cultural migrations on the one hand and social change or development eh, on the other hand, in which I then see migration as, as a, let's say, uh, as a factor that um, uh, to, to a certain extent uh, influences developments. I get this idea from Patrick Manning, uh, who is a, a historian from Pittsburgh, a big name in global history, and in one of his latest books, he has um, developed this idea of migration, cross-cultural or cross-community migration, in his words, as an engine of social change. So the idea that people who have very different backgrounds, different languages, different world visions, different skills, technologies, that when they meet, something new will, um, uh, will happen. Not uh, necessarily positively. Eh? This can also result in warfare or destruction, etc. But new it is, and social change it is. Um, therefore, um, so inspired by many, um, together with my brother Jan Lukassen, I started thinking about, okay, what, are, what is then cross-cultural migration? How can we typologize it and how can we measure it over time? And so we started thinking about this in, in 2007 and 2008, and then uh, worked on this project in the last six years. And so what I'll present today is, let's say, the latest uh, uh, frontier where we um, have arrived at, um, at now. So the typology that I represent is meant to capture the main expressions of cross-cultural migrations roughly in the last half millennium, so between 1500 and now. Before I do so, however, let me first um, go into some um, examples why I think that the, the, the kind of definition that we, and all the typology that we developed, is important and how it diverges from mainstream migration studies. Um, yes. Sorry? Touch the screen. Touch the screen. Okay. Right. Um, 
so let me give an example. I already mentioned soldiers, soldiers as migrants. And this is not normal in mainstream migration studies. Mostly soldiers are left out or not even considered as, as migrants. Why should we do so if we are interested in social change? Is demonstrated by these two books, by uh, Maria Heun uh, especially. And especially A Breath of Freedom is a very interesting example. So what Maria Heun and others have done is um, studying especially American soldiers overseas. Not so much fighting, but uh, as a um, uh, be, being um, um, in, in, in American bases, both in Japan, Asia, and in Europe, especially Germany. We're talking about millions and millions of Americans who were sent to Germany, for example, for two years after the Second World War um, uh, as their tour of duty, including Johnny Cash and Elvis Presley and, and many others that we know. So most people would not consider this as migration. It's temporary. Um, it's uh, uh, the assumption that they're isolated on these bases, so there's not much contact, etc. These books show otherwise in two respects. One is that there were many more contacts also locally uh, between uh, Germans and these American soldiers, also leading to a lot of uh, relationships and children and, and uh, German women then um, uh, following their hus new husbands to the United States. But also the Americans as a kind of importing the American way of life and consumption patterns and popular culture, etc. But most interesting is a Breath of Freedom book, which shows that uh, the most um, crucial and uh, a change that was forged through these migrations was through black soldiers. African American soldiers, most of them who for the first time were in a, landed in a society where it was not normal to have racial barriers, to have Jim Crow kind of legislation. And, and the Breath of Freedom shows that many of them, upon return, were very changed. They, for the first time, they, they saw what they experienced in Mississippi or Alabama was not normality, but was something that had to be questioned deeply. And uh, it shows how they started playing a role in the civil rights movement. So yes, they only were two years in Baden-Württemberg, maybe, but, uh, uh, but upon return, they, um, uh, they had a big influence in forging social change in the United States back then. So this is a very good example, I think, why we should be, uh, take also temporary um, uh, migration and migrations of soldiers very seriously. Well, maybe less controversial, uh, and, and Ron already um, mentioned this, are internal migrations, and if, especially internal migrations in former or still empires, which are very multi-ethnic, multi uh, uh, with, with many languages, religions, etc. Well, China, of course, is the example at the moment. Um, uh, and many studies show not only the, the huge part of the population, some 200 million of the floating population that now in the last, let's say, since the mid 1970s, since Deng Xiaoping have moved to cities, um, but also the social changes that it forges, um, especially also in the Chinese family system and, and the normality that the, uh, the parents would choose marriage partners for their children and the very sub, uh, subordinate role of women. This all is now changing in these big cities. So more neo-local marriage patterns are now developing, um, very different from, let's say, the Chinese tradition and patriarchy is declining. I mean, this it's still fragile, it's still beginning, but anthropologists have done very interesting studies uh, on this. So also there you see interesting, not only economic changes, uh, but also a very interesting cultural and social changes through these internal migrations. Um, but also if you look at Europe, um, internal migration still matter. Also in the post-war period, well, this is a um, um, Rocco e sui fratelli, uh, this is the French translation of the movie from 1960, um, which is about internal migration from the Mezzogiorno, from the south to the, to, uh, to, um, uh, to the north. Um, this is very much about uprooting, and because it, it, this is not a happy Hollywood ending, I can tell you, um, uh, the Rocco brothers will all, well, uh, it, 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 it ends badly for them. Um, but it is an example of the huge differences existing in Italy, and to a certain extent still do, uh, which makes that, let's say, people coming from the south and settling in, in northern cities like Turin and Milan uh, experience very similar 
um, um, have very similar experiences, for example, than Moroccans in Rotterdam. For, and also, with that migration, it changes their lives and their lifestyles, etc. So also, internal migrations, even in Western Europe, um, are part of the picture. Then, forced migrations, um, including slaver, slavery, yeah, people, Africans taken to the Americas, for example, but let me, let me give you the example of um, deportations within Soviet Russia, especially under Stalin. Um, you could say this is a kind of, what Stalin did was moving millions and millions of people, especially to the East, and uh, kind of forced colonization into semi-empty uh, areas uh, where people were, um, were, were taken to for all kind of ethnic and political reasons um, uh, that, uh, uh, of the Soviets in the 30s and 40s and also early 50s, but this is especially a uh, development of the 1930s. Um, this is a tremendous mixing of peoples within the Soviet Union, mixing in terms of class, think of the kulaks, of religions, of languages, um, and of course of rural and urban, and urban experiences. So if we want to understand the changes that the Soviet Union went through in the 20th century, migration is key. And we still need to study this much more in detail to and, and also focusing on, on the different kinds of changes that we can um, uh, distinguish. Then finally, uh, a category that is studied by geographers and also by social scientists are what I would call organizational migrants. And, and this is uh, explained more in depth in, in an article that I wrote with uh, Anik Smith and which will be published by the Journal of World History next year. So what are organizational migrants? These are migrants whose migratory pattern is primarily determined by the interests of the organizations that they work for. This can be the state, think of diplomats, can be the church, missionaries, can be large companies like Shell, talking about expats, but also soldiers. Yeah? So you have high and low skilled organizational migrants. Um, often they, they join these organizations voluntarily, but not necessarily so. I think of the Yanisar soldiers in the Ottoman Empire who were just taken from Christian families and then raised as high-skilled uh, uh, bureaucrats and soldiers and also sent uh, uh, throughout the very large Ottoman Empire. Why is this important? Although it's often uh, uh, quite small numbers, well, at least the high-skilled, not the soldiers, is because very few organizational migrants can force huge social changes. Think of missionaries and, 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 and um, uh, colonists, for example, and think of why hey, Latin America, most people now speak Spanish or Portuguese. Uh, well, this was not forged by well, millions and millions of Europeans, but by a relatively small number of what we can call organizational migrants. So you have them, how does this work? Well, uh, yeah, so these are, let's say, the organizational migrants. If you uh, uh, use skills and institutional logic, so, they have, so these are the high-skilled organizational migrants with a high institutional logic. If the more low-skilled are uh, in this box, and then you have people with high skills but not attached to an organization here. Migration studies mostly focuses on this uh, part of, uh, of, of the scheme, my um, um, uh, argument is that we should look at the whole picture if we want to understand the relationship between cross-cultural migrations and social change. Ah, it's going all right. Um, so what I plead for is a much more broader view than the view that uh, most, in most studies um, uh, is being taken. So, what, and this summarizes, let's say, uh, the, two, the differences between the two views. If you look at the yellow or greenish yellow column, that is what most, that's in mainstream migration studies, um, uh, the implicit assumptions. The implicit assumption that migration only becomes interesting and worth studying when there is a high cultural distance, especially people have different, ra they have different racial characteristics or different religions, or when they're strange um, uh, when, when they come from afar, so when the geographical distance is high, uh, we mostly want them to stay because it becomes very messy when people only stay for one year and then leave. And so it's a kind of A to B and then stay kind of migrants. Um, we tend to prefer 
um, that uh, these migrants forge uh, in, uh, uh, new social ties, at least in the, in, the long, in the long run. As I say, we tend to prefer people with a low class background, um, so let's say labor migrants, that's what the bulk of the studies focus on. Um, mostly we, we, we exclude, let's say, internal migrants because it's, it's mostly about international, so about aliens um, in the technical term. Um, and we very much prefer migrants who have uh, low power, so who join and follow the rules of, 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 of the country of destination. And we prefer people, uh, migrants who are free, who move freely, what, whatever free then means. So what we often then exclude is, let's say, the, the opposite. Um, so people who are considered having a, a, the, the low cultural distance, for example, the Aussiedler in Germany, are often also in studies that they say, yes, they come from Russia, but they're not really immigrants be because they have this, this German culture. Well, all kind of studies show otherwise, but many of these Aussiedler did not even speak uh, any German, uh, but anyhow. Um, we tend to exclude internal migrants who come from very nearby um, areas. We tend to exclude temporary movers, seasonal migrants, uh, uh, sojourners, uh, uh, etc. Um, well, and so on. So, the, uh, um, if we want to establish this relationship between cross-cultural migration and social change, however, um, uh, this is not, let's say the yellow column is not the best um, uh, point of departure, but I would, uh, my plea is very much to, to take a much more broader view. Um, so, to sum up, what we have been a prisoner of is, and, Jim, and, and Ronald already mentioned James Scott, and I'll go, this is a, a, an earlier book of, of, of Scott, Seeing Like a State, is that we are to some extent prisoner of, the st of, of state definitions. And we also, as, we, as researchers, we often tend to reproduce these kind of definitions. Um, and this is, and to use a, a word that James Scott likes very much, this is a myopic way of looking at the phenomenon. And um, especially because as a historian, I of course always tell my students, well, the nation state is a very, very recent phenomenon, especially if you take, let's say, the longer term perspective. So if you want to understand migration in the long run, uh, the, the nation state is not the most logical uh, unit of analysis to take. We, we really need a, uh, a, a unit of analysis that, um, uh, that also encapsulates experience of people before the nation state arose in the 19th century. So um, this, and let's say this thinking in only in nation state terms leads to, I think, partial conclusions about the phenomenon also at the moment in, um, in retrospect. So normally Stephen Castles would have given this uh, keynote uh, lecture, but he couldn't come. And this is from, a, uh, from his well-known book, The Age of Migration, that he wrote with, uh, with Miller. Uh, in which we can read that migrations have been part of human history from the earliest times. Well, he's absolutely right there. However, international migration has grown in volume and significance since 1945, and most particularly since the mid-1980s. Migration ranks as one of the most important factors in global change. Um, also, the last century I have no trouble with, but I think what is partial and also misleading is the idea that migration or international migration even is something that is a real new phenomenon. Well, yesterday also the Damic uh, figures have shown otherwise already, uh, but also if we uh, use this more broad definition of cross-cultural migration, um, uh, we really get a different picture and I'll show that in a moment. Um, so what Jan Lukasen and I did in developing this, um, uh, this cross-cultural migration rate method is to, um, to calculate, because that's what we do, uh, to, uh, we calculate the chance for any individual to experience at least one cross-cultural migration in his or her life. Um, and it depends on what, let's say, a geographical unit. You, you can take a country, you can take a region, but you also can take a continent. That's up to the researcher. And this is then, let's say, the, the formula uh, in which we have summarized it. Also, in order to, 
to make sure that if people follow this method that they, they do, the, um, let's say, use the same kind of indicators than we do. So the model is very simple. This is the, let's say, whatever unit of analysis you've chosen. This can be a region, a country, a, a continent. So what we basically do is to, to measure this chance um, is to look for 50 years periods, which is, let's say, the average uh, uh, life expectancy in most of, of, uh, of periods of history that we have looked at, so from 1500 up till now. We look at who is coming into this, uh, into this region, which we call immigration. Uh, we calculate who is leaving this region, uh, emigrants, but especially we are looking what is happening within. So people moving to cities from, from rural to urban settings, uh, people moving from land to land, which we then call here colonization. Um, but we also look at multi-annual migrants, especially soldiers and sailors, this is, and we are looking at seasonal migrants. The idea is that in all these, these migrations, people do cross cultural barriers. Yeah? The, the city is a different place than the countryside, at least for most parts of the world, well, for China uh, until today, and for most Europeans until the First World War. Um, uh, the same is for colonization. People often went to ecologically very different kind of structures, and, and these were not empty, there were already people living. Um, soldiers are already given an example why, we, why soldiers, especially soldiers who, um, uh, not all soldiers, not, not let's say not all draft, even if you just are drafted and you don't fight a war, you stay inside your country, we don't, we don't count these soldiers as migrants, but all the soldiers that venture out into other areas and have these cross-cultural contacts are counted. The same is for international sailors. And then seasonal migrants, because they move from, let's say, areas of low commercialization to areas of high commercialization, with also different kinds of, um, uh, um, uh, different kind of values and different kinds of circumstances than they are used to in um, the more the peasant areas where they came from. So these are the six categories that we, um, uh, that we um, have distinguished in the... Uh, in our model, in our, in our typology, I should say. Uh, and these, of course, clearly go beyond state-centered definition and allows us to compare um, um, uh, uh, migrations in, in areas, both international and internal. So the, the, the state boundary does not really matter in this model. Let's see, seven minutes left. Um, so if you, um, and we have developed, by the way, this, 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 this method in two articles in the Journal of Global History and two um, online papers from the International Institute of Social History, two research papers where you will find all um, the data uh, at country level. Yes, because that's where the, 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 the data are. But, so you can uh, use different, different um, um, uh, levels of analysis um, um, uh, as you choose. So, um, and this is the, mo the last publication um, that's also, you, you can see I put the book on the table in, in the coffee hall so you can have a look, which is comparing, uh, or applying this method to both Europe and Asia, and especially China, Japan, and Russia, but also parts of, 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 of India and Indonesia are, are included. And also a chapter, by the way, and Ronald already uh, mentioned this, about Zomia. Uh, uh, so what, what uh, the, this this um, uh, concept that not James Scott, well, James Scott has popularized a bit, is from a Dutch scholar, Willem van Schendel. Um, so, okay, what are the results? Can I have your points, please? Um, so, what does this, if you use this method, how do the developments in Europe then look like? Well, here you see between 1500 and 2000, um, uh, these are the, uh, the, the, the rates, so the, the, the percentage of the population, and this is, real, this is really a bare minimum of the population that experience at least one cross-cultural move in their lives. What you see is, um, uh, to, to start with, uh, that Zielinski, and, and Ronald already mentioned it with this mobility transition, seems to be, sorry, seems to be right to some extent. There is indeed a, a large increase in the 19th century in these rates of migration, but I think he is not right by assuming that before modernization, uh, um, people were very, very sedentary. There are still um, important parts of the European population that were highly mobile, especially, and that's not strange for Europe, as soldiers, because the, especially the early modern period is a long period of 
intense warfare and, and, and millions of, of, of soldiers went from north and south and to east to west of Europe to fight uh, and, and also to, to conquer. Um, but you see a dramatic increase, um, especially in the 19th century, but what is interesting is that the peak is not in the second half of the 19th century, but in the first half of the 19th century, and this is largely explained by TMA, temporarily multi-annual, and this is largely 90% of these people are soldiers. So this is the two world wars that you see um, uh, expressed in, in this part of the, uh, of the column. A, a, a second interesting uh, development, of course, are the people who immigrate to Europe. Um, so we're now talking about people from Africa and, and Asia. Uh, it already starts here uh, uh, at, at lower numbers, but uh, becomes larger here. So this is different from what Castles and Miller show us in their definition. Now you could say, well, um, uh, because this also includes me. I'm also, where I, am I? This is two cities. I'm somewhere here, because here we included all the internal moves from the countryside to the city. And when I moved from the province of Limburg to Leiden to study there in 1978, um, uh, I, uh, I'm included in these numbers. Now, you could say, well, the 20th century, is this still equals cultural migration? Right? Because in the 20th century, European nation states homogenized, maybe not Italy, uh, but let's see, a lot of European nations became so culturally homogenous. The, is this still, um, uh, can this still be considered as cross cultural migration? Well, if you think it's not, should not be considered as cross cultural migration, then you can put it out for the 20th century. And then the, the first half of the 20th century stands out even more uh, because the soldiers are still there. The world war, two world wars we cannot just eliminate, uh, of course. But also, even if you say, well, soldiers, okay, I get your point, but isn't this stretching the definition too far for whatever reasons you might have to, um, uh, to be critical about that? You can also put them, uh, leave them out, and then this is the so uh, this is still includes uh, people moving to cities, but then these are people coming from a different country. So this includes, uh, let's say, Italian, uh, Italian uh, uh, peasants going to cities in, in, in a different country. Uh, and here also, of course, the, the, the immigration, sorry, the immigration uh, category becomes larger because the other categories are now left out. Uh, but still, uh, the first half of the, of the, in, uh, of the 20th century uh, in, uh, has the highest rate and not the second. But here you see a quite homogeneous block when it comes to rates, which only start um, uh, increasing drastically from the mid 19th century onwards. Um, so I think what this shows is how important migration has been in, let's say, the cultural development and social changes that Europe underwent uh, from. Uh, the early 19th century onwards. And I think this, this presents us with a better picture than only looking at international migrations. Um, so in the few minutes that are left, I would also like to, um, to make a, a brief comparison, and that's what we do in the book that I just mentioned on Eurasia, um, to see what um, this method does if you compare huge chunks of uh, um, uh, very large um, units of analysis, that is Europe without Russia, Russia uh, itself, China and Japan. And, uh, and this of course is, 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 is at a very high, the most aggregate level that you can get, but you can break it down according to the types and you can also break it down to, to smaller geographical units. Well, this is interesting to me because of the great divergence discussion among uh, especially economic historians. So the idea how to explain that uh, Europe accelerated, especially Western Europe, at the middle of or the end of the 18th century and left China behind, whereas uh, China and Europe were almost at the same kind of level of development in the mid-18th century. Well, all kinds of uh, uh, factors that are being mentioned, but migration is not part of that discussion. And I think what you see here is very clearly this um, uh, divergence um, here um, uh, from these, where in, indeed China and Japan, but Japan uh, picks up earlier than China. And here, of course, you see a 
convergence in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and especially what, of course, what you see for China here is this huge uh, urbanization um, uh, migration that, uh, that we all can read about in the newspapers today. So I do think that uh, if you want to understand the social transformations that different parts of the world underwent, this kind of method is helpful in, in order to, to see these kind of larger trends. But of course, this is only the beginning because we are now, uh, th these are very highly aggregated macro trends that, that we are seeing. They are highly interesting, but as Ronald already said, we also have to look at the mezzo and micro levels. Uh, so we're only at the very beginning of our understanding of these large processes of cross-cultural migration. So what we need to do are the next steps. First, to unpack these total aggregate uh, cross-cultural migrations rates um, and, and, and look at how, what, what role the different types play. You will see, for example, in China, which also has quite high rates in the 18th century, I didn't show you now, uh, but it's much more composed of colonization migration. Chinese being sent to the frontiers of the Chinese empire, whereas the Europeans were moving to cities already in the early modern period, which of course has different kinds of social and development kind of effects. Then we, uh, we, what we can think of is attach weights to the different uh, cross-cultural migrations. So I think that uh, moving to cities has a, a greater transformatory effect than moving to, let's say, a frontier area to farm. Um, we also have to add migrants' capital because uh, we have not talked about that yet. Uh, so what, what are the various capitals that they bring in? Then we have to add the migration regimes that, 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 that function as a filter for what these migrants can do at destination. It's a it's very different position of a Pakistani worker in the Gulf states uh, where, let's say, there is no open access and very limited possibilities or someone getting a citizenship in Canada and, uh, can, uh, and having much more possibilities to, to develop and also to, to have contact with those who are already there. And of course, we have to unpack what is social change. I mean, these are, uh, the, the, this is a very um, a large container as well. So this would then be the model if you uh, add these kind of things. So the cross-cultural, sorry, the cross-cultural um, uh, typology. So it's, Difficult to, where is my, well, anyway, uh, you see it all on the screen. Because cultural migration, we have to add these migrants capitals, and this is especially at the mi more at the micro level, I would say, but membership regimes are hugely important, because they, again, as they determine to what extent people, and also migrants can, let's say, employ their capital, yes or no. Um, and of course, slavery uh, is a very different uh, membership regime than, let's say, a liberal democratic state. And that, in the end, will determine uh, the, the, the kinds of social changes uh, that then occur. As I said, we, this is still very much in, in the beginning, but I hope and I do think that this is a useful model if we want to think about the relationship between cross-cultural migrations and social change. And those of you who are interested in, um, well, in, in, in this, this kind of approach, this is the most <coughs> recent summary in this book where we have all the chapters on Europe and on Asia and, and parts of Asia, and you can get it with a 25 discount, uh, percent discount. Um, <laughs> it's all on the table. Sorry for this plug, um, uh, but my publisher uh, forced me to do this. Um, <laughs> So I think I'm, I'm, I'm way beyond my time and I would like to leave it at this. Thank you. <laughs>